Because you have opposition. <laughs> You're on. Okay. Yeah, it's a live mic. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session today on Snowden and looking at the balance between privacy and security. My name is Jason Healy. I'm with the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. I run the Cyber Statecraft Initiative. And we have a phenomenal panel today uh, to talk about this issue. For excellencies who will share with us a few initial minutes of their thoughts on this issue of Snowden and the balance between privacy and security. And then we'll be getting in to questions and answers between the panelists themselves and then with you, the audience. The order that we've decided to go in is to start with Minister Carl Bildt, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, and certainly uh, one of the most distinguished statesmen in Europe. We will then be going uh, to Professor Shlomo Shiro, the Director of Political S Studies Department in Bar Ilan University in Israel, uh, and previously the Director of the Israeli Government Ministry Security Union, Unit, and he looks at intelligence, crisis management, cybersecurity, and social resilience. Then we'll be going to the Ministry of the European Parliament, Representative Maritia Shaka, um, a Ministry of uh, European Parliament, and has been a really one of the most significant voices on these kinds of issues and looking at the digital society, as well as specializing in issues with the United States. So a wonderful voice to have. Uh, and batting cleanup, we have Secretary Michael Chertoff. He is the co-founder of the Chertoff Group that looks at cybersecurity as well as other issues in Washington, D.C. and around the globe, and was also one of the first secretaries of the Department of Homeland Security in the United States, where he was able to look at both sides of this issue. Without further ado, Mr. Bill, would you take us off? <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, it's often the custom to start with uh, some figures in order to try to understand the, the mind-boggling nature of the development that we are in the midst of, where we are moving into a hyper-connected world and hyper-connected societies, societies that are living in and dependent on the cloud. Just a couple of figures on what I think is the number one development at the moment, that, that is the mobile data, the mobile <coughs> broadband. We've been fixed with sort of the normal fixed internet, but it's now going up in there in different ways. We had an 80% increase in mobile data traffic last year, 88 to zero. We have two billion uh, people who are now subscribing to mobile broadband, two billion people linked up to technology that wasn't there 10 years ago. And estimates is that in a couple of years that would be 8 billion more than as a matter of fact, um, if, because you can have several subscriptions of course. Within five years on present trends, you will have 65% of the population of the world would have the possibility or will be covered by mobile broadband with higher capacity than we have in the European Union today. 65% of the world will be covered by it. And, of course, this links into the different data centers that are there. <coughs> we have roughly 6,000 big data centers around the world where you have tens of petabytes of information, and huge information of information, roughly half of them in the United States and half of them spread around the world. That is the realities of the world today. And I would argue that sort of the cyber politics is going to be 
for the, two, for the 21st century what geopolitics was to the 19th century, knowing that geopolitics, we thought had gone away, it just made quite a significant comeback, but cyberpolitics is going to be very big indeed. We are moving into what we call the Internet of Everything, and we are moving into the age of big data. This presents huge opportunities. I think it's one of the biggest instruments for economic and social development in the world today. The World Bank is doing the calculation that we have a 10% increase in broadband coverage, you have a 1% increase in the growth rate of that particular economy, for example in Africa, where this is, and, and connectivity is now growing faster in Africa than anywhere else in the world. So opportunities are vast throughout the world. But of course, challenges are what we are going to focus on, and those are no less daunting. I would put the number one challenge that we have, the right reliability of the systems. Since we are going to be so enormously dependent upon these systems, we have to be fairly certain about the reliability of them. If our economies, our health systems, our whatever, are dependent upon the networks and the cloud, then the networks and the cloud must work. There must be redundancy, there must be the safety, there must be the security, and at the end of the day, the state will have to have some sort of responsibility for this. There are the sort of related security issues of different sorts. Um, the net is a reflection of societies, of all of the good and all of the evil that we have in society. Criminality is all over the place, and that needs to be fought on the streets and on the net. The same responsibility for the state. And we have, of course, states that are acting with the over the net, subversion, attacks, cyber war, if we go to the extreme of it, we must be able to defend our societies as we defend them on the borders, as we defend them in the air, we need to defend us in the cyberspace as well. And then all of the privacy issues that have been very much highlighted recently by Snowden uh, and by the discussion in different countries and by the discussion that we are now having on the amount of data that is collected by the Googles or the Facebooks or the Netflix or whatever, and the commercial market that is there, particularly in the, um, in the big data world that we are now entering. Discussions are vivid, and that is good, because there is a need for principles and there is a need for some laws. There is a discussion in the US on what to do with NSA and what to do with FBI, we have uh, our discussions in Europe at the moment. Uh, the European Court of Justice just threw out the data retention directive that had been decided whenever that was a couple of years ago. And we says that uh, fairly similar to some of the base in the US, where you preserve all of the metadata. In the US it's been done by the NSA. In our countries it's by, by the telecom companies. We've been forcing them to do it and then authorities can access this particular metadata under regulations that are slightly different in different countries. And now the European Court has thrown out the entire thing and say it doesn't meet the basic standards and we have to go back to basics on that. And uh, that will focus the debate quite a lot. This, in my opinion, makes it necessary to have some basic principles for state activities and state surveillance activities on the net. State surveillance activities are there on the net, they will be there on the net forever. And I would say the state has a duty to some extent, a law enforcement duty. But in much the same way as that law enforcement duty in the normal society is heavily regulated by the law, it must be heavily regulated by the law on the net. And I have been in different international fora in Seoul and Sao Paulo trying to introduce a debate on some of the principles that I think should guide this the legality and the proportionality and the transparency and the clarity on those particular rules. That's easier to do in open and democratic societies than in the closed societies, but that is, uh, is uh, not stopping us. And finally, just mention mm -hmm. the last of the issues, just, and that is the governance issues of the net. Welcome to a short the way we have this sort of this web or the ecosystem of governance of the net. It is now under challenge by regimes that try to grab power over the net because they want to grab power 
over the flow of information in their respective societies. And that's going to be another of the sort of big battles in the years ahead to preserve, the ex preserve and refine the existing system of governance of the net so as to prevent it from being grabbed by either big business or big states or other interests. It must be an open, multi-stakeholder system of government. And thank you for, for being so broad on that. Because it's one of my concerns when, I, when you saw this topic was Snowden as the lead off. Because Snowden starts to put us in a US, UK government mentality when we're looking at privacy versus security. And you were broad enough to, to, to look at beyond that. And we were talking in the other room, we, we discussed it's not just government, but if we're looking at privacy and security, we can think about um, privacy with respect to companies and with respect to others. It, it doesn't just have to be a national issue. I also especially like your, your touching on the reliability of the system. Because uh, I think when this I gets a lot, her, very much lost, uh, if we are only focusing on the privacy versus security, then we're next? missing is some of this larger discussion of the actually, other kinds of governance that we need to make sure no the answer. internet is going to be, for, no for want of a better word, sustainable. Uh, that it's going to be there and usable by our kids and grandkids like it was for us. Uh, one, one quick follow-up question. You really mentioned these practice. principles, and I, I saw you talking when about them in Seoul, by which killed. national government intelligence should be, war, um, might be regulated as a small R word. Has that been getting has that been getting picked up, or are you starting to see more more governments willing to talk about that? Well, I think it has been picked up uh, quite substantially. I mean, uh, there are a lot of elements of it in the U.S. debate. Uh, there are elements of in the European debate, but I think more more of that will come. Some governments have fairly stringent regulations on how they conduct sort of intelligence activity. And uh, as said, I mean, this discussion inside the European Union on data retention directive, uh, because in, in the it is two different debates. What, it, what is one debate in the US is two different debates in Europe. Because you have the NSA uh, collecting meta, meta data. We don't have our intelligence agencies really doing metadata to any large extent, to my knowledge. That is done for and domestic security through this particular Mr. system. But metadata is really much more, uh, I mean, that, that's the biggest privacy issue for the ordinary citizens, really, than for a lot of the intelligence collection issues that are being discussed. Somebody prepares them, Thank you very much. And since we're on intelligence them, here, it's a, it's a fantastic them into the um, transition. So is Professor, when you destroy thank you. Those um, security and when privacy is all about information. And uh, information uh, is fast becoming a key element in both place, political power and in military power. Um, we off. have to look at the way uh, the world, um, uh, the sources of world and global power tra transitioned over the last two centuries. In the 19th century, um, the key to political and military power was industrial capability. And industrial capability um, enabled a small rainy island such as Britain um, to occupy and rule a quarter of the universe, of the world. Um, industrial power then meant uh, that smaller countries could rule over larger ones. It uh, enabled to some to a great extent also colonialism um, because one country had more industrial capacity than another. And then we moved to the first half of the 20th century. And then the source of military and political power were conventional military forces. And we can see that the best in the examples uh, of the First and the Second World War, where conventional remark, forces, of course, uh, played a key role. Whoever had more tanks, Stalin, more planes, troops, more soldiers, and so on and so forth, uh, sought to influence events in Europe, but also throughout the world. And then we have the Cold War. So for 30 odd years, the, um, the key to political and uh, military uh, power uh, were nuclear weapons. We right up to the end of the 1980s, nuclear weapons played the role, a major role, in being the source of military and political power of influence, everybody sought to have them, those who didn't felt themselves as second class countries and so on and so forth. Um, then when the Cold War was over, for the following 20 or 25 years until today, it was energy. Energy, fossil fuel and other types of energy which became a key element in political and military power, the ability to influence through energy events in other countries in other regions.
It is not a coincidence that most of the wars in the last uh, 25 years were in or around the Arabian Gulf area where most of the world's fossil fuels are concentrated. And now we are moving to the next phase and that is uh, information. The key to political and military power is information. And uh, strong, large countries and countries which perceive themselves as global players or regional players collect this kind of information, metadata, big data, whatever you call it, um, but uh, they see this as part of projecting their ability to influence. Now, nobody here, I hope, thinks that the United States was listening to the mobile phone of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel because they thought she's hiding some Al-Qaeda terrorists in her kitchen. Well, I checked in the kitchen, there were none. Um, they are listening to their phone and possibly to a number of phones of people here in this room because they think they have something to gain because it's part of projecting power. Collecting this type of information is becoming fast a rule, a rule of gathering power. And it's not going to stop because the Americans perceive the advantages of collecting this kind of information as to be much greater than the protests of their allies. Basically, it's going to continue because they can get away with it. Um, about a third of humanity, I estimate, is catalogued today by intelligence services of different countries. A third of humanity. Probably all of you here in this room. Are you worried about it? Maybe you are on a personal level, but on a political level, you probably most of you are not worried. The information exists somewhere, but as long as there's no abuse of that information, nobody seems to be worried. And uh, if we are seeking real privacy, you have to move to live in a cave in the Gobi Desert, because this has disappeared the way that typewriters disappeared to technology, the way that uh, horse-drawn carriages disappeared, and they are simply not coming back. Um, future technologies which are being developed today are going to make the type of uh, monitoring and surveillance of today in five years seem completely antiquated. I'll just give a few examples. Um, fingerprint um, recognition technology, um, for example. Today you already have in your mobile phone or camera face recognition technology, which five, six years ago, intelligence services developed at the cost of tens of millions. Your phone can recognize faces now. It will soon be able to recognize and read fingerprints from far away. So if any of one of you was to raise your finger up, and I can just see your finger for one twenty-fifth of a second, which is one frame of a film, then technology will enable to recognize that fingerprint with great precision as it does with your face, with the number plate of your car, and so on and so forth. That's just one example. Intelligence collection through nanotechnology, manipulating ordinary items, ordinary materials to be gatherers of information. If you will touch something, that's going to transfer information to somewhere else. This is not science fiction. These are technologies which are being developed um, today. Also, the whole issue of virtual identities, avatars in social networks. What kind of we are used to knowing our acquaintances because we meet them sometimes and we talk to them. But now many of you have relations with people you've never really seen in life. Do you know whether they really exist? or not? Do they look like the, the picture they emailed you? Do they have the background of what they are telling you and so on and so forth? Think about the creation of digital identities on a very large scale. A group of students made this experiment and tried to create non-existing people and insert their data into the databases of local authorities in order to be able to produce voting cards for local elections. In three countries, they were successful. Mm -hmm. So are we going to see a phenomena of impacting politics by non-existing people, by avatars, by digital personalities? It sounds crazy to you, but it will be realistic in five to ten years. So we have to think about that um, already now. The, in the future, the distance between reality and virtual reality will blur. Of course, we will still be in reality, but digitally that distance will blur. What are the conclusions? I'd like to touch briefly upon four points. Um, first of all, we need to redefine privacy to a more limited personal sphere related concept. I don't want to be what? That's not good enough. I will be. In Britain today, there are more CCTV cameras than there are citizens. 
over 80 million actively only in Britain. So to say I want to be private, I want to have privacy, that doesn't work anymore. Let's limit it. I will say maybe I don't want to be watched when I'm showering or when I'm in the toilet. You know, or, or when I'm having a nice romantic evening with my girlfriend, that may be acceptable. Uh, maybe but privacy that. will have to be limited, uh, and it's not going back. The world will not have European privacy Union the way our grandparents had Ukraine. before. European governments and corporations uh, must said, clearly take uh, more defensive measures in order to safeguard their secrets. Uh, and this is an era, area that has been neglected the since the early 90s, since the el el end of the Cold War. People you said, well, the KGB is no more of a threat. We don't have this big uh, bipolar world. Uh, Nobody's going to steal our secrets, and therefore we don't need to spend as much effort or money. Uh, Keeping your secrets is not expensive. It starts with uh, a mindset. You have to think and define something uh, as important enough here, to be kept secret. It's not a question of money. It starts over here. And we must develop ways democratic ways of controlling the information that is collected. Because stopping the collection of information, whether through regulation or whether through compliance, it's not going to work. Today, small high-tech companies started by three young guys do more information collection than large corporations like Microsoft or Google. And it will develop in the future because these technologies are not stoppable. It is a fact. The information is connected, is collected and being processed. Can we develop democratic means of controlling, at least preventing the worst abuses of that? One example that comes to mind is the nuclear proliferation regime. The technology for developing nuclear weapons has become slightly simpler and cheaper over the years. But the world has been clever enough to develop the type of norms and regimes and international organizations to some extent, to a greater extent, to regulate this spread of nuclear weapons. We need to do the same against the worst abuses of information, warfare and information manipulation. Thank you very much. And that's a, that's a very high bar on looking the nuclear European proliferation. There's a lot that I really like what you said, uh, especially that now that information is now becoming Europe the basis of everything, whether that's uh, our own personal lives, whether that's conflict, government power uh, and national security power, as you emphasize, or corporate power. I think this has helped frame the debate, and especially if, if we go back to the, snow, the, the snowed in in the, in the first part, or snowed uh, under, part of our title. Uh, and then I think you can, I could see this a lot in Washington, D.C., the feeling of Washington, D.C., of this is espionage, this kind of thing had happened, without necessarily catching the sense that when it was only spy versus spy, it didn't affect things that you or I would touch as part of our daily lives. But now that information is so much part of what we do as our daily lives, Lives. Uh, to These things that are now part of spy games, to back and to forth, to are touching things that you and I touch, that all of us do as part of our normal lives, right and that shifts us into a different context. So I also like that you're talking about nowhere. this power, because I've seen when we talk about cyber power, uh, um, this mismatch or this mutual suspicion between uh, the U.S. and China. The, Chinese, the U.S. feels very vulnerable to Chinese cyber power, because we see uh, nonstop uh, espionage uh, that the United uh, States uh, feels uh, that we, um, uh, we feel our throats uh, are strategically uh, bare to this Chinese is espionage and that we are vulnerable. When you talk to the Chinese, you can see they you know, see, feel similarly vulnerable because everywhere they look, they really see uh, America on uh, the high grounds of cyberspace, Actually, looking down at them from the commanding heights, whether that's Microsoft or Google or IBM or NSA and the U.S. Uh, Cyber Command. So moving on to the next panelist, um, Representative Shaka, I'd love to hear your thoughts on and what we've heard so far. Thank you. Um, I think it fits in, but I want to go back a little bit more to the principles uh, underneath this discussion. Oftentimes when there is talk about balancing freedom and security, it actually means that they are zero-sum, that if you add a little bit on the one side, you lose a little bit on the other. And I think we have to 
completely end that notion and we should see them as uh, integrally connected. Um, but specifically the practices of the NSA as far as we're aware, and of course uh, there are most likely many, many others, but I'll use this case for the moment, is that you see with a lack of oversight, whether it's judicial or democratic, with a lack of transparency, with a lack of checks and balances, and with a capacity that has been accelerated so much by technological developments to have mass surveillance, bulk collection of data, we have to ask ourselves, where is the proportionality? And if you see practices like undermining security technologies, like encryption, or using a market of vulnerabilities like zero-day exploits, then you really have to ask yourself, where is the beginning of this gathering of information and promising uh, security Putin and where is it actually being Union undermined? Because, because I think under the, the guise of 100% security, which is of course already a promise that no government can meet, the, the, um, the and the guise uh, of protection against attacks from the outside has is, actually led uh, to a serious erosion of democratic principles uh, from the inside. Uh, and that also uh, threatens the promise of the open internet, which has uh, political, uh, social, economic and potential. So uh, and I think the fact that the impact, as we, we now know, of these decisions are global and also means we need global but solutions. The major is that so I think like we have to look for a set of rules or norms uh, with which uh, a number of stakeholders are involved in setting them, but also in adhering to them. And I'm just going to mention them as democratic principles for the moment. And we have On the so one hand, there are companies that have a huge potential for developing new business models and making lots of money, agenda, uh, but with power, I believe, comes responsibility. There was the example of faking identities to influence votes. Imagine so how easy it is to influence uh, the outcome of elections with just altering search results uh, in an engine that many, many of us use every day. The question is how to hold companies accountable, how to ensure there is sufficient transparency to know where vulnerabilities vulnerabilities might be, laws, uh, and how to ensure that they are not um, uh, overexposed. So, especially now that, that governments rely on private actors or critical infrastructure, but services that are used by entire societies every day, uh, or for uh, very serious security measures. History. The cheapest government in this whole hyper-connected so environment and, and given these new technologies, I think, so much pay, sometimes play a smaller role than they historically did, while we they continue to bear ultimate responsibility uh, for ensuring code. national security, but also for ensuring the fundamental freedoms of their populations and for protecting and them from overstretch of either state or company, ensuring competition, and I think governments should really their money, take their responsibility them, in ensuring that there is no like uh, cyber arms race or proliferation of tools like to that may be intended to ensure more security, but which in the wrong hands the could really uh, create a serious strategic risk. <laughs> now, consumers or citizens, depending on uh, which angle you take in looking at them, are probably the ones that are uh, snowed under, uh, or the public value or democratic principles. Because um, it is easy to say we must make sure that there is no abuse or that there are no vulnerabilities or that there is no unauthorized access to their devices. But at the same time, we see so many examples, incidents really, that remind us daily of how vulnerable they are and thus how vulnerable we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. at the same time, there is a great potential for citizens and internet users to connect across borders, to form horizontal networks with a huge bottom-up power that has great democratizing potential. And that's why I think the difference in approach that the NSA took between looking at gathering intelligence on US nationals and foreign nationals is really an artificial one. It's also insulting for allies, of course, like Europeans. Uh, but it is unjust and it creates risks that are economic, that are political, and that are strategic. Now, I think there is a need for more political leadership. Uh, of course, being a member of the European Parliament, I think the EU is in a uh, unique position right now to take that leadership to fortify democratic principles and resilience of our systems and our open societies alike. Uh, there are other arenas where this fight uh, is being played out. Uh, it was mentioned that in internet governance for us, states form unholy alliances seeking to speak about national security, but really to, to gain a more strong grip over the internet, to 
sometimes nationalize it like the Islamic Republic does, uh, and we have to be very, very careful for that. But there's also the arena of the market. Uh, there is already uh, an estimated loss of um, uh, economic um, value and market share for Silicon Valley after the NSA revelations, and uh, we see that, uh, <coughs> that there is a real development of a competitive advantage of ensuring privacy more strongly that citizens are also seeking in the services that they use. And lastly, another arena is, of course, the courts. Uh, we've had two very significant rulings of the European Court of Justice recently, one on data retention and the other uh, only yesterday on the so-called right to be forgotten. Now, uh, I'm sure that, that the last word about that has not been said, but it shows that with a lack of political leadership, a lack of ensuring that democratic principles are meaningful in the context of a hyper-connected environment, other arenas will take over. And it is, uh, it is I think, upon us to show more leadership. Uh, a consequence of a public mistrust of the United States, uh, but also of security measures as a whole, is a risk that is looming. Uh, Pew did a research that American citizens are worried about their own government uh, intruding uh, their private communications. And in the European Union, I see a broad uh, concern, concern also, also reflected, reflected in important, important uh, negotiations, negotiations such as on the transatlantic trade and investment, investment partnership. partnership. Uh, anyone, anyone who was worried about stronger uh, US uh, ties or, or about the environment, environment or other, other, other issues, issues now have a uh, very good extra reason <coughs> to, um, to be hesitant. So, so to, to sum up, um, we, we have, have to um, look at what the implications, implications are of alleged security measures on freedom and, and also on the credibility of open societies, such, such as the United States, States globally. globally. I, I mean, the, the whole promise of internet freedom, freedom that uh, Secretary, Secretary Clinton uh, had is uh, now, now quite, quite a hollow uh, one, one for activists in Egypt, in Iran, in, in Syria, Syria uh, who really worry that it was only an excuse to get a sense of what they were up to. So, so it is, I think, think high time, time that, that we uh, fortify, fortify democratic, democratic principles, give, give them more meaning, and, and that, that we show that security and freedom cannot be in some sort of balance, but that they should, should never be a zero sum. They're integrally uh, related, um, essential for people, uh, not, not just for systems, systems or technologies or engineering, or engineering but really the people that we're dealing with, and uh, uh, not doing so creates strategic uh, risks, risk, economic risks, risk, and it's really uh, unacceptable, unacceptable in the day that we live in. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. fascinating. Thank, Thank you. And it certainly, I think, fits in with a lot of people's experience in this room of, of understanding this relationship <laughs> and, and, and saying there's not necessarily a trade-off in that. I'd like to, to hear from Secretary Shirtoff and then come back on the support of the democratic principles, because it's certainly something that's come up in, in, in the first three. And Minister Bilt has talked about these, these seven areas, um, looking and also looking, looking at internet, internet governance, governance. Um, uh, Professor, Professor Shiro brought, brought up, you, you can't, can't stop collection, you have to manage with democratic controls. controls. But, but how, how to do that, that I think is going to be very important. And can we mm -hmm. get enough mutual sense of transatlantic, um, what, um, what privacy means and what these standards are going to be to be able to do that in a way that, that works for, for each society as well and works between societies in this, in this international space. Uh, with that, I think... <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Um, well, you know, great provocative comments. Um, I think this is a very hard set of issues. And um, as I'll try to explain in a few minutes, I'm going to take it at the outset. Um, depending on which lens you look, used to look at the problem, you can come out with very different answers. So I don't want to minimize the, the challenge of dealing with, with these very important um, fundamental questions. Let me begin briefly by just trying to um, uh, puncture the a lot of mythology about NSA. Um, first of all, uh, to say that NSA operates without oversight is really misunderstand what happens. In fact, there is a court, a, a foreign intelligence surveillance court, that uh, supervises all of the actions that NSA takes. And uh, the program that got a lot of attention initially in the United States, which is the metadata program, is a program that was approved by the court. In fact, numerous judges approved it. Uh, obviously, obviously, they're operating, operating under U.S. US law because the United, United States doesn't, doesn't respond, respond to European law, it responds to our Constitution and our, our right, right to privacy. Um, and, and the program the itself only collected the following data. data. Uh, outgoing telephone, telephone number, receiving telephone, telephone number, 
and duration of the call. They didn't even have the names of the subscribers. In order to get more information than that, there had to be an individualized basis to connect up that number, one of those numbers, to an ongoing investigation involving terrorism, and then you could go further, and the FBI would go and use various legal tools to get access to, uh, for example, subscriber information or things of that sort. The utility of this program, by the way, is it allows you to determine whether someone who's making calls from a safe house in Yemen is talking to someone in the United States. And in fact, there's a, looking back on, on the period before September 9, uh, September uh, 2001, 9-11, it turned out that had this program or this capability existed prior to September of 2001, it would have been possible to learn that one of the hijackers who was in communication with a known bad telephone number overseas was actually in the United States. Without the program, you couldn't tell where that person was. So th there's real value, but it's a very tightly constrained program. Um, the second objection that's raised, and I, I understand a little bit about where this is coming from, is we don't extend the same um, privacy protections to non-Americans. But, you know, I think that's true of every nation in the world. Uh, pretty much any nation of size has an intelligence service. Ask yourselves, what, what's that intelligence service doing? Because whether you're acquiring intelligence through electronic surveillance, or whether you're stealing it by sending a secret agent to steal something, or whether you're cultivating an informant uh, so you can get somebody to tell you things that are confidential about other countries, every country that has an intelligence service is doing that. If not, they ought to get rid of the intelligence budget because all they're doing is clipping the newspapers. When I came to Europe as a public official, if I was going to have a sensitive call, um, I understood I had to do that on a secure phone in a little tent-like structure that was designed to prevent people from being able to use external means to collect the conversation. I wasn't offended by it. I understood that even among friends, there are things you want to know. Now, do you balance that? Do you, are there certain things you, you don't do? Um, yeah, I think you, you, you do need to balance it. And there are certain costs involved. But anybody who tells you you can live in a world without spying and without intelligence collection, uh, you know, I guess you shouldn't collect on, on Russia. And we shouldn't know what they're going to do, what their next plan with the Ukraine is. So I think that, again, to be realistic, this is part of the world. And, uh, you know, there ought to be some sense of balancing the intrusiveness versus the importance of the information. But I think it's naive to believe that we're not going to have spying in the future. You know, back in the Bible, uh, uh, you know, Joshua was told by God, send spies into the land of Canaan. So this has been around with us for, for really thousands of years. But let me turn to what I think are three other issues that are, in many ways, um, less part of the debate, but I think fundamentally more important. <clears throat> First, on the issue of, of volume of data collected, I think the point that's been made here is absolutely right. We are collecting so much data now that we don't even uh, fully understand all the information about us that is being kept and managed and analyzed. But here, it's not the government that's doing it. It is the private sector. Uh, big data, the largest market capitalization for enterprises outside of the energy industry is now data companies. Companies that collect, analyze, assimilate data, and use it to market things to people. And if you think about not only into, you know, conversations or emails, which are some of the um, companies actually do look at, for example, Google, if you, if you use Gmail, will actually mechanically or, or automatically review the content of your email in order to determine, um, you know, whether certain keywords are there. If you combine that with locational data, data that's collected in supermarkets when you use a, a card in order to get a discount, but they now know what you're, you're buying, there are going to be technologies that will allow your television set to determine whether you're actually looking at it. And all of this is not actually in the service of protecting us. It's simply to sell you stuff. So I think getting our head around that and, and what we want to do about that is going to be a major challenge. But as they say on, on American television, there's more. We have all become surveillance agents of each other. Or we're worried about big brother. I worry about little brother. When I walk down the street, in particular because some people recognize me, sometimes people take my picture. Or they ask to take a picture with me. Or they might upload to their um, Facebook account that they met me in what I said. And this information is aggregated in a cloud. 
uh, by a cloud provider who, at least in the United States, has the capability and arguably the legal authority to look all across those various accounts. There we go. And assimilate that and develop a picture of what it is I do at 24 7 without ever asking my permission. And we're now at the point that it's, we now have scandals where people record private conversations on cell phones and they upload it to YouTube. And now that becomes a basis to terminate someone's employment or in order to boycott a company. So as we start to complain about the surveillance state, we need to look at ourselves. We are becoming the most powerful surveillance agents in the world just as individuals. Uh, third area, how do we deal with the issue of, of making sure the government doesn't over intrude on the internet with the fact that we need to secure the internet? You cannot have privacy without security. What do I mean by that? Let's assume you have an enterprise a business or a government that makes promises or has a legal requirement that they cannot misuse your information. They've got to use it only for a particular purpose. That's great. What if someone can hack into the database, steal the information, and use it for some other reason? If the company can't protect its own data, then the privacy promise isn't worth the paper or the, or the digital medium that it's written on. So privacy requires security. The government is in a, in a, a critical um, position to play a major role in securing the internet. But we also know that different governments around the world have different ideas about what security means. In the United States, we think security means we don't want someone to steal your things or interfere with the operation of your machinery or your industrial control systems or to, or to uh, abscond with your credit card information or your money. In other countries, uh, the idea of security is we don't want to have bad ideas or unpleasant political arguments on the internet and they want to censor things. So how do we come up with a way of talking about securing the internet that allows us to keep bad people off the internet, but doesn't become a vehicle for censorship. Final thing, um, <clears throat> which I think has gotten conflated with some of the Snowden stuff, and as I think, frankly, a source of irritation between the Europeans and, and the Americans, really has nothing to do with the internet or spying. But it has to do with a, a problem that's been around maybe for centuries, and it's the conflict of laws. What do you do in a globalized society where people are operating in multiple parts of the world, but you have different legal regimes. And much of the complaining, for example, that actually emerged in the press about the United States had nothing to do with NSA. It had to do with the fact that in a, in a civil case or a criminal case, if a US judge wants to issue a warrant or a subpoena and require information under the law, um, they're going to insist that any company that does business in the US turns that information over. And sometimes the enterprise feels it's subject to a conflict with laws back in the home country. But it's not just the US that does it. When European countries were investigating tax evasion involving Swiss bank accounts, they wanted to have the Swiss banks turn over that information. Now, did the Swiss say, sorry, you can't have the information? Well, if they did, the tax authorities or the judicial authorities in other countries insisted that that be turned over. Now, I don't have an easy answer to this because we do live in a world where you have multiple jurisdictions that have legal authority over uh, what you do operationally and where you keep your data. And I do, I do think it's important for us to figure out a way to reconcile these things so that uh, we can have a legal system that obtains data that you need for, for you know, serious and important matters, whether it's uh, violent crime or economic crime, but also respect the fact that we do have somewhat differing ideas about what the standard ought to be. Um, but again, I, want, I guess what I want to emphasize is this is not about spying. This is about courts. And I used to be a judge. And I tell you, judges in the US, when they give an order, they expect it to be followed. And I'm willing to bet that's true of judges in every other country represented in this room. So a lot to talk about and a lot of complications. That is fascinating. And it'd be very interesting if we could look back 10 years from now and see how much of these incredibly important decisions uh, and issues we're talking about here actually do get decided by the courts rather than courts or companies rather than legislators or, or some of the other democratic processes that we're talking about here. Um, so I'm going to, we looked a little bit about the mechanisms and the governance. Um, and so I'm going to ask one follow-up question in that and then after that I'd like to start picking up questions from the audience. And 
talking about mechanisms, especially Mr. Bill had talked about um, looking at reliability and resilience of the structure. Because when we started looking at what structures we had, we, we, we loved for internet stability. We got ourselves into a finance sector analogy of 2008. And we had the financial meltdown. We realized we didn't have the governance to handle this kind of fast moving international shock that could easily spread between countries and you had contagion. Now we had the G8, we had the IMF, we had um, the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. So at least there was a foundation, but it quickly got overwhelmed by the speed, the complexity, and national sovereignty. And we said, what would happen if we had an internet shock? You know, not just a configure or a, um, a heart bleed where you have to change your passwords. But one of those things that, like how the finance sector meltdown went from Wall Street to Main Street very quickly, <laughs> that goes from a meltdown of, of certain companies. I mean, imagine if a, a cloud service provider has a Lehman moment. It's there with everyone's date on Monday and gone with everybody's date on Friday, and it's gone on Monday. We've so included the internet in our lives, as Minister Bill talked about, that could lead to a cascading shock into real society. And at least for finance, we had the G8, we had the IMF, we had the Bank for International Settlements. And he, those weren't enough. So when we're thinking about these structures and how to deal with this, there's one more problems than we tend to think about, especially if you're only focused in solely on privacy versus security. You know, this this probably false trade-off. Uh, but also there are other models that we can look at for how we've handled some of this governance. This isn't completely new that we're looking at uh, an international spa space where companies might, uh, where countries might feel that they have limited sovereignty when exposed to the full force of these international forces that are coming on. So everyone touched on these, domes uh, these democratic principles of how we got that, uh, how we might get past this. But I get the feeling like none of these were very e easy. I mean, Minister Bill, you had talked about these seven areas that might um, dictate when we're looking at, in, at international espionage and spying. I'm curious, and this is a general question to the panel, what other specific ideas have we seen that might get us to this, to this more democratic principles? You know, if we were going to say, all right, we're going to get together for the G20 um, later this year or the G20 in 2015 in Turkey, are there specific ideas that we, that we can carry forward if, if that would even be the same, you know, the right venue? Well, I think we have, we have a multitude of different international processes underway in order to look at these particular issues. But, but first observation, and, and you indicated, I mean, the dangers that are there, if there would be a meltdown of the nets, there would be a meltdown of our societies. It is amazing how well this thing is functioning. I mean, it, go back 10, 15 years in <coughs> time, it was all run by or managed by a couple of nerds um, out of California or Sweden, or, uh, and I've been to some of their meetings, and I mean, you wouldn't recognize them as people of power. It was basically run by some nerds, and they set up the system under the so-called multi-stakeholder approach. It has worked amazingly well. And that is why when we are now discussing the governance issues of it, my basic instinct is, if it, if it ain't broke, let it be. But we clearly must have more safeguards in it uh, of different sorts. I'm worried that those regimes that are talking the most about it, the Chinese and the Saudis and the Iranians to take Russians to take four, their agenda might be to put it in those terms slightly different from ours in terms of what they want to achieve. When we talk about stability, we mean stability of the existing system. When they talk about stability, they speak primarily about the stability of their regimes. And, and, and that has different implications. Uh, but I, I, I do think that the one good thing that might have come out of this Nobel thing is that we, we get more of a discussion on the principles, which is clearly we need to have certain standards and certain principles regulating state behavior on the net. Mm -hmm. We should also be aware of the fact that there's state responsibility on the net. A state has a responsibility to protect its citizens, offline and online, uh, but it must be heavily regulated. And the citizens of the respective countries must be confident that that system takes into account 
the basic, basic values, values of, of the society. society. That, that is, is not the case at the moment. moment. Mm. Uh, and that, that we must sort out. out. Yeah. I'd like to get a representative back see if you had any comments on that, or if not, then I had one follow-up question. So I think one of the key questions is how does it the territory of the nation state, jurisdiction of the nation state, relate to this hyper-connected reality. And I think Mr. Trevor made a very important point by saying a judge uh, should rule, and this implies that there are rules, and the, the reality is that there is often a legislative or a legal vacuum. Um, and that if there are laws, United States, with a currently, and this is what I want to note with emphasis, currently disproportionately powerful market in technology companies uh, that, that allows the United, United States, States law enforcement to have extraterritorial impact over lots of citizens all over, all over the world. world. Imagine uh, that, that this may change, change that, that you, you have, have to wonder, wonder how, how to protect, protect your citizens from the extraterritorial impact of some, some Asian, Asian countries' laws, laws with very uh, different, different values than, than your own. own. So, so we, we have, have huge vacuums domestically. domestically uh, for, for example, I'm thinking about we, we have, have no regulation on export controls of some, some systems, systems and, and technologies that are heavily intrusive, intrusive. mass surveillance, hacking, hacking et cetera, et cetera that, that we sell all over the world that are made in Europe and that come back as a boomerang, boomerang both, both when, when it comes to human rights, rights uh, violations and to our strategic, strategic interests. I'm, I'm thinking, thinking about, about the issue of negligence of companies. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chair, uh, rightly said, uh, for the business models of some of these companies, data collection is very important. This creates potential vulnerabilities with a public impact. If, if we, we don't, don't have laws of, of what is negligence, negligence what are the consequences, should, should there be a reporting obligation, obligation then we, we have nowhere to start to hold people accountable. accountable. The, the same, same with uh, weakening, weakening encryption, encryption uh, for, for intelligence, intelligence services, services to have access. access. I'm, I'm sure, sure that was, was not written in any law because perhaps the laws were made when encryption technologies did not exist. And so we're talking about rapidly changing, rapidly developing technologies with much slower uh, decision-making, decision especially when, when it's democratic, democratic domestically, or per nation state, state, let alone coming, coming to, to these international, international norms, norms that I think we all believe are necessary. Uh, but, but the complexity, the complexity of that involving, involving all those stakeholders, stakeholders agreeing on these norms, looking, looking at how to enforce them, it's a massive challenge, but it's the one we have to tackle because before we know it, um, balances are shifting even further, risks are getting even larger, and I, I'm not um, uh, ready to just say, well, uh, technologies, technologies will develop, develop as they, they do. We, we can, can still set, set norms based, based on values um, and yeah. accept that, that there may be, be competitors who are willing uh, to, to go, go further, further than we are, are. Uh, but, but at least to, to, to set, set an example, example of stopping this race to the bottom. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I've, got I've got a big, big follow up on that, that but I want to let me hear from the two of you. I was going to just, as you have answered, I'm particularly interested in if there are ways that we can not get so caught up on our own fight between Europe and the United States that others carry the field. Um, and and that, that's a general question for the panel as we go forward. I, I, mean, I, I guess I would say, I mean, I think we, we all agree this is a, a challenge we have to tackle. I, I agree with Minister Bilt. I think this is an area where less is more. And you have to be very careful about uh, trying to construct a system um, and that's, that's going to generally answer all these questions. questions. I suspect the solution to multiple, multiple elements, elements of the problem will be a series of solutions that are built over time, time. Mm. kind of like what we call the common law method, where you, mm. you, know, you kind of uh, empirically test something, see if it works, and you try to develop a rule to govern a certain set of cases, but you don't try to boil the entire ocean in a single pot. Uh, one, one of the reasons is because I think we have to be very careful uh, not, not to confuse our, probably what is in this room, the almost universally prevailing view of freedom and uh, the way people ought to be able to communicate their ideas freely. We ought not to confuse that with the ideology shared by other parts of the world. Uh, and I don't just mean governments. There are parts in the world, of the world, where there are ideologies or religions that take the view that actually freedom of speech is not a high value. That, that, that not, not challenging or defaming or disrespecting, or disrespecting is the higher value. value. So, so um, the, the idea, idea that somehow the whole world is going to come along with us uh, uh, on, on the, the progress, progress to a free speech, speech utopia, utopia, much as the West might, might believe, believe that's, that's where we're headed, headed. I, I think, think it's, it's is not an accurate assessment of where the world is. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with that fundamental disagreement, I think, about some of the principles of civil rights and civil liberties. 
But there are some areas I think we can achieve agreement, and maybe the most urgent ones, and I think the minister mentioned this as well. Um, as worrisome as it is that the internet can be a basis for collecting information uh, or stealing things or, or defrauding people, uh, what worries me the most is the fact that many of our physical control systems are now part of the internet. And uh, the internet of everything, I mean, they, they do experiments. Now, you can remotely control an automobile. You can, uh, apparently, at least in the lab, remotely interfere with a pacemaker or an insulin pump if it's wirelessly connected to a monitoring device. Um, we're talking about having a smart grid where all the power and the electricity is connected through monitoring stations so that can be hacked into. Um, you know, we run the risk, and this may be happening right now, that uh, part of what will be uh, war making and the doctrine of, uh, of international conflict will involve attacks in cyberspace. We saw it in Estonia in 2007. We saw it in Georgia in 2008. Uh, we ought to take a closer look at what's going on in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be very careful to have rules of the road about what is off limits, even in warfare in cyberspace, just like we do under Geneva in physical space. And that's an area where I actually think you probably can start to begin to build some common rules, and where I think the failure to do that could result in an absolutely uh, catastrophic outcome. It was one of those areas, uh, before I go to Professor Spiro, that 2013 saw two huge trends. One of the trends that we're here to talk about, we learned through Snowden and others exactly what was happening, um, the Iranian attacks on U.S. banks, on, on spying, and we saw all of this covert cyber conflict and espionage, and that seemed like the main trend. Um, but there's another large trend in, in what Secretary, Secretary Chertoff is talking about here, where you saw governments getting together and really coming up with some agreements. U.S.-China meeting at the presidential level, U.S.-Russia meeting at the presidential level, U.N. group of government experts, 15 countries getting together and agreeing that international law does apply, including Geneva and Hague Conventions. So very important ground was covered um, that should be very important and frankly very familiar to this audience. So I think it's going to be up to seeing what happens in 2014 and 15 and to see which of those two trends, this increasing conflict and espionage or this increasing agreement between governments is going to be the more important trend. Professor Schur. Um, I think the need for more international cooperation and international agreement on this stems from the fact that the digital revolution has made two of our most important um, um, elements in security uh, obsolete. And that is deterrence on one side and law enforcement on the other. Much of the security of our societies is based on law enforcement and based on deterrence. If you do something bad, the police and the courts will put you in prison. Um, and on an international uh, scale, if one country does something bad to the other, then the other may retaliate. Um, the whole concept of deterrence and law enforcement have broken down. They are useless uh, in, in, the in the global world, in the cyberspace. Um, how can you deter activities of two or three kids on the other side of the universe? You know, Today, three kids in North Korea or, or five in, in, in India or wherever uh, pose perhaps more of a threat than the nuclear weapons of a superpower 30 or 40 years ago. Um, you can deter the, the uh, activities of a country, of a nation, but how can you deter a bunch of people? And moreover, how can you deter a bunch of people who are already willing to die in any case, as some terrorists uh, are? Um, they don't care about losing their lives. How can you deter them even from, from not using the most extreme um, weapons in cyber warfare? Um, law enforcement by nature is regional. You have the London police and the probably the Bratislava police or the US FBI and so on and so forth. Law enforcement has always been regional, but how can law enforcement act when the perpetrators um, of a theft of some money here in Bratislava are actually in Cameroon or in northern Nigeria, on the other side of the universe, on the other side of the world, with a completely different set of laws, or possibly no set of laws whatsoever? We see the problem in a small scale in the piracy off the coast of the Horn of Africa, um, but this kind of piracy is actually in cyberspace very prevalent. Uh, the hijacking of files, the changing of files, the blackmailing of companies for their encryption of their own information, and so on and so forth. So, so tools that we had 
Deterrence on one hand and law enforcement on the other are becoming fairly useless, and we need to work together, government to government, in order to find new methods of deterrence. Can I get my microphones up front, please, for the, for the first question here, and then the second question back here? Uh, John Reed. Thank you very much. Declaration of interest. I have worked for some years with Michael Chertoff when he was <laughs> Homeland Security Secretary and I was Home Secretary and now he's a partner in the Chertoff Group. Uh, not surprisingly, I kind of agree with him. Uh, that's because he's independently reached the same decisions as, as I have. I want to say something a little bit controversial, but it actually follows on from what Shlomo says. Precisely because cyber renders, you know, cyberspace, renders all inherited legal frameworks, indeed to some extent, sovereign nature states, more or less redundant, and deterrence doesn't work, and three billion people have been empowered symmetrically, that is not an argument against global surveillance, that is a good argument for global surveillance, because if you don't have deterrence, and you can't deal state to state diplomatically, then only global surveillance begins to give you a warning in order to protect people. And that's the sort of controversial position. I want to challenge the assumption in the panel, uh, well, at least most of the panel, that Europe, the peoples of Europe are seething with anger and worry that the states in which they're a member are carrying out surveillance. I do not, that is not my personal experience over 30 years working at the ground. And let me give as an example the quote that was used by Shlomo that appointed the massive number of CCTV cameras in Britain, 80 million. Let me tell them why they're there. They're there because of the demand for local people, particularly in areas where politicians don't live, where there is high crime and disorder, to protect themselves, the sons and the daughters. So, so the main point I make is there is an awareness among people of the need for surveillance in order to get security. However, it is also true that you have to have oversight based on principles. And this is my second contention. Those principles certainly exist in the United Kingdom. They're very simple. If you want to know who's writing to whom or who was phoning whom, then you have to do it under one set of legislation. If you want to know what's in the letter or what the content of the phone call was, it's the most stringent legislation. And on top of that, you have four levels of scrutiny from Parliament through to the Home Secretary to Information Commissioners. So it is true that that will need to be updated. It is true, as Carol says, there hasn't been the awareness and discussion that there ought to have been, but it is not true that the principles do not apply and we're trying to update them. And then I'm going to sneak in a question. The dog that didn't bark is called Snowden. And this question is quite simple. Are we safer after Snowden's revelations or are we less, less safe? When I say we, I mean the people in the United Kingdom who have suffered quite a number of terrorist plots and unfortunately lost terrorist lives, all of which have been on an international basis and involved international communication. And, and, and I don't want to lose your, lose your first point. Uh, and the second one is going to be uh, back there. Um, oh, the first point of are the worries so much in this interconnected world that the interconnected surveillance is the main way out? And, and to me, I think Professor Shiro is oh, going to touch on this a little bit, of saying that co if collection is ubiquitous, then trying to put controls on collection are a fool's errand. I'm sorry, it's a paraphrase. Um, and how you handle that information once it's collected. And I, and I think that's compatible with your, with, with your contention that if the collection is universal, then you've got to rely on collection not just to keep us safe. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm trying to cross things, but, but I wanted to take that point first before I got to, got to your Snowden point. Does anyone want to pick up that, that first one, that, that more surveillance is, is going to be more important? Uh, no, I, I just want to pick up this, the very last question, which I think is from a political point of view an important one. Are we more or less safe because of this? Uh, that, 
I'm thinking think about what's the answer. I, I think the answer would be we are probably more safe, but a lot of people feel less safe. Hmm. And, and that's, that's a democratic, democratic problem in itself, itself. that the uh, revelations, revelations of something that some of us might have been very much aware of, but lots of people were not aware of, and might have been carried far too far in certain cases, makes people scared, and makes people afraid, and makes people uncertain, and makes them feel unsafe. So even if in a physical <coughs> way, more safe against terrorists, and more safe against crime, in another political way, they feel less safe. And this we must sort out. It's a democratic problem in our societies. And it's a question of getting the, the understanding of these things. And some of them are exceedingly complex. I mean, there are very few lawmakers, be that in the European Parliament or in the National Parliament, that understand the complexity of these things. The US Congress is the same. Um, and, and there's even more confusion in the public. And the more public debate that we get over these issues now, the more would it be possible to bridge this particular gap so that people understand that some things are necessary to make them safe, but they should feel safe as well, because that's also value in the society. I mean, I, 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 agree, I agree with what Carl said, and I think that, um, you know, there are a couple of, of dimensions to this. First of all, a lot of what Snowden's put out is exaggerated or out of context or, or just flat out wrong. And it's, it's, in fact, they've had to correct some of it. So that, of course, is part of the problem. Um, beyond that, though, I, um, some of the issues he raises were actually out there and debated uh, in 2004 and afterwards. And nobody paid attention. It reminds me, I used to, when I was in office, I used to say if I really wanted to give get something in the front page of the newspaper. If I went out and gave a speech, it was like page nine. But if I wrote it out and I wrote draft on it and I had someone give it to a reporter as a leak, page one. The, you know, part of the problem is that there, were, there was information out there that anybody who was reading the paper would understand, generally speaking, what we do, but nobody wanted to, to pay attention to it. And then once it's leaked, and it's a scoop, and everybody gets on, on top of that. That being said, I do think that we probably should make at least the general standards of what we do more transparent. I think there was a little bit of a tendency in the intelligence community to keep everything quiet. And, and if one person had an objection, everybody kind of conceded. And I think there's a cost to that. I think that you know, if you look at the legal opinions, for example, that have been declassified, I don't think those opinions compromise operations. I think actually when you read them, you go, wow, these judges really, you know, analyze um, what was being done under the American legal standard, and it's thoughtful and it makes sense. So I think in that sense, we've sometimes been our own worst enemy by being more obscure than we need to be. Okay. Well, I just wanted to, to challenge this notion that more surveillance is going to lead to more security. It may just as well with the same systems lead to more vulnerability. Imagine if somebody goes into those CCTV data and what information they then have. And knowing the fact that governments rely on private actors over which they have very little oversight to perform all these kinds of mass surveillance tasks, I think we should be very careful with, uh, with what road we're going uh, down on. And it, it's simply not true that it cannot be stopped. Uh, there are uh, parameters within which you could say, uh, you know, how secure the data has to be, how it should be secured, how long it should be retained, under what circumstances, what is proportionality, what is probable cause. I mean, I think, I think our open societies distinguish themselves from others. In, uh, in not doing certain, uh, certain practices by governments or, or uh, others, these the individuals, because we believe that the open society has superior qualities uh, for, for people's liberty, and we have to preserve them, and we should not uh, just look at the angle of how mass surveillance is, is possible and, and how it could be used uh, to make people feel more safe. There is a, a danger in that because it could actually make them more vulnerable. And I think that if a couple of kids uh, in, in uh, any given country um, could so easily access our systems and make our systems vulnerable, then we have to make our systems more resilient. I mean, we cannot just accept this uh, as, as a flow of technological development against which rules and, and governance cannot do anything at all. I mean, let us dig a little bit more deeply in assessing these problems. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the voices that's not here, and I'm going to take the last, I'm going to take these two questions at the same time and, and get the response from the panel. One of the voices that we don't have here today is really the voice of the technologists. 
Um, and because I've got a, a twirly mustache, I'll, I'll pick up their voice. But it would be very, if when we have those conversations, you end up in a very different kind of a conversation because there are some of the uber nerds um, that Mr. Bill had talked about that are in the middle of the debate of saying, do we, how much do we have to care what governments actually want of us? Um, there's famous, uh, most famously this had come out um, something like 20 years ago by John Perry Barlow and saying, look, we, we, here's an internet manifesto and the stuff that you governments do don't apply to us here in, in cyberspace. cyberspace. We, we are, are different, we have our different rules, and if things, things are bad here, we will be the ones, ones to fix them, them because you don't have standing, standing in this place. Mm -hmm. And, and it will be, be a big, big I, think I think it's going, going to be an interesting, interesting trend that a lot, lot of what we're discussing, discussing here in this city over the next couple of days is coming from the assumption that sovereignty matters. And there's a group of folks out there that are saying sovereignty doesn't need to matter. And as a matter of fact, are trying to invent themselves out of sovereignty to some degree. And, and so we can, must always keep that in mind of saying, all right, if governments, 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 of course, we're going to matter, but that isn't necessarily proven in this area. Let me get these questions, I'm going to get your question, I'm going to get this question, and then we'll get the answers from the panel. Please, sir. My name is Ahmed Shahabuddin. I work with the Huffington Post, with HuffPost Live. And, uh, you know, because we're talking about consequences, and, and the, the importance, importance of government, government cooperation. cooperation. I'm curious, you know, after, after the Snowden revelations, revelations, it was very clear that, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, friends spy on friends, allies spy on allies. But last week, week there was a report um, that Israel had spied on the U.S. or was continuing its spying, and it was called by Newsweek, uh, according to various Obama administration officials, sobering, terrifying, alarming. And, and to, to use the line that, that both uh, President, President Obama and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, Netanyahu have used, that it crossed, quote, red, red lines. Of course, I find red lines to be inherently problematic when we use them to discuss international politics. politics. But my question very quickly is, when we talk about trying to do something and trying to uh, have consequences, why is there this alarmist surprise uh, from Obama administration officials in this particular instance? And what does this suggest about the lack of any accountability when any government is found to be spying on another government, let alone if they're allies? And, and, I'll, and I'll let the Secretary turn off and Professor Shlomo to, to kick off answers on that. Um, can we get the, the microphone here next, please? Very much for this very interesting discussion. My name is Stefan. I'm from CERN. I'm protecting your technologists here. I'm protecting my organization. And when I protect my organization, I did the risk assessment. So my question is very straightforward. In installing 18 million CCTVs, in making mass surveillance and big data analysis in huge computer centers, or in weakening encryption encryption protocols, is this giving overall a benefit? compared to the threats we are trying to protect against. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, and actually I saw one over here. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take all three questions. The, uh, the, the woman all the way on the, on the left end. And the microphone's coming here. Thank you. My name is Farid Allah, I'm from Libya. I'd like to ask Mr. Michael, now, I have been hearing you, listening to you, now, with all the information, the power, the, uh, the intelligence, I wonder why you have not been yet able to identify who was the killer of the American ambassador in Benghazi up to now, and we get so much confusing information that Maybe they know mm -hmm. and they don't want to use it. They are holding it. So this is my first question. Secondly, the dictator Gaddafi controlled us for 42 years with the Western technology. So when I hear principle, ethics, governance, democratization, where is business from this? So in my opinion, I think now, after listening to you very carefully, after living in Libya, under the new Qaeda and the new Taliban and the new Afghanistan and the new radicals and looking to what the EU is trying to do, the American are trying to do, the Friends of Libya, big failure 
We don't, don't know. know. Is this is hypocrisy? hypocrisy? Is this is lack, lack of information? And, and let me get to, let me get the answers because I'm getting the three minute signal here from Daniela. Um, so let me start getting getting the answers. And um, we had a few. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, Secretary Church, there were kind of maybe yeah, maybe yeah, a few for me. Right in there. If I forget one, remind me. Um, so on the issue of, of this latest uh, report about you know, Israelis spying on Americans, I, I can't speak to the administration. I don't know why they said they're shocked. I mean, as you all know, Jonathan Pollard, I don't know, about 20 years ago, was convicted of spying for Israel and 30 and is in jail and, and will probably remain in there. You know, there is a certain amount of uh, spying even among allies, partly sometimes because allies worry that other allies may perhaps be wavering or... Um, may, have may have a, a, a different, different agenda. agenda. And I, you know, yeah, it, it is, is what it is. is. Um, on on the, uh, uh, the second question was about um, r risk balancing. I think that's the right answer. answer. I, I, I happen, happen not to have a problem with CCTV. I don't see much downside. But for example, this is a personal opinion. On the issue of weakening encryption, my own view is it's a bad idea to weaken encryption generally simply to make it easier to break into things. If, if, if you feel you need from an intelligence standpoint to break into something, you ought to develop the ability to do it. You shouldn't weaken the standard generally. So I do think you ought to balance these things. Now, maybe others would draw the line differently. Um, on, the, on the point about Libya, um, I, I, you know, there's a lot of controversy in Washington now about Benghazi. I have no intention of stepping into that in the S and Fornets. Um, but I think more generally, it, it's, it, it, it's a, a broader set of issues. I think that there are much, I had, on a, I have no sympathy for Gaddafi, and I, uh, his elimination from a moral standpoint was a positive for the world. Whether doing it as and when it was done um, strategically made sense, I think, is a different question. Uh, particularly when, when you wonder whether the lesson to countries, for example, like Iran is that when you give up your nuclear weapons, the West comes and kills you. So um, I, I do think, or nu not nuclear weapons, but nuclear program. So I do think, again, we need to, I, if there's one message I take out of this conference is we need to be very strategic in thinking about the, the various ups and downsides of almost any step you take, either in the virtual world or the real world. Yeah. And, and I think your point on what the company is able to, uh, what, what Tyrannical government to able to do with Western technology fits in very well with with your point on, on the democratic controls and, and how do we do this? Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm I'm getting it from Daniela, so um, let's go, let's finish up with with closing points. Um, there are a few other points that I might clean up with at the end, but let's go ahead and, and I think. Why don't we go? Why don't we I think I've, I've said yeah, enough. Yeah, I've said enough. Surrender my time. Okay, I'm going to try to answer your questions and sum up because it really boils down to the things that I've already mentioned. It is very clear that we already live in a hyperconnected reality. What we do in one place can have a ripple effect into unknown places uh, coming back as a boomerang. And it creates both threats and opportunities. Let me also stress the opportunities because I don't want to just uh, emphasize the risks, but it, it is sometimes necessary. So I think it, it creates for lack of better terms, some sort of a global constituency where people in Libya know who provided the surveillance technologies to their dictatorship, or in Egypt, or in Syria, or in other countries all over the world, where we also have a young generation which could use the internet for improving their lives, their freedoms, their opportunities, and they, this could also reflect on values in which we lead uh, by example. So uh, one of the things that I mentioned, and I think has to do with, with Concrete policy measures that can start setting a norm and be enforced is export controls. I don't think it is justified that we have no regulation except for sanctions on some uh, excessive cases where we don't even export uh, foods anymore either. We don't have regulation about uh, technologies that can have a huge impact all over the world, and we already see uh, proliferation. Uh, and I think it it means this global hyperconnectivity uh, and, and the impact everywhere that we have to think about the legitimacy of measures not only at home but, but how they are seen elsewhere and how that has a strategic impact. So I think that that should be part of kind of a not only technical threat assessment, which I think is important, but also strategic uh, assessment. Uh, so I do think we have to lead by example and do that much more ambitiously. All of the things the gentleman from CERN said I agree with. Uh, I think that those are very important points to make and that it is not about a balance. Uh, and I think 
that the question about whether or not weakening encryption protocols has strengthened or weakened security is a key question, and we have to ask ourselves, who's going to answer it? Who is accountable for doing it? Is anyone ever going to be held accountable according to any law by any judge? And I'm afraid the answer is no. And this is precisely the problem that we have to address. These are very far-reaching consequences of decisions by very few. And uh, it has economic impact, strategic impact, security impact, political impact. And uh, we, we are not even close to a framework uh, of dealing with these kinds of uh, major problems. Um, regarding, regarding the question, question that was asked by the audience, I'm always very positively entertained by uh, the, the extent uh, that fiction authors uh, like to attribute to the activities of Israeli intelligence. intelligence. Um, a year ago, a tourist uh, woman was bitten by a shark uh, in Sharm el Sheikh in southern Sinai, and the Arab media was full of reports that this shark was sent by the Mossad in order to destabilize tourism in Egypt. Uh, a few, few months, months later, later, a bird carrying a, a, a ribbon with the inscription Tel Aviv University, University came, came down somewhere in uh, Turkey, Turkey, and, and Turkish, Turkish authorities blamed the Israeli, Israeli intelligence for carrying out surveillance over their territory using birds. Um, so, so I think, I think the, the veracity of these reports coincide with the reports you were talking about. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's funny that no, no, we're, 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 that, we're that, but, follow, but I'm I, sorry, we're over time. That's, you can follow um, up afterwards. I, 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 I was very much touched by, by what the lady from Libya said. Uh, she has lived under dictatorship, to some extent sponsored by the West and by Western technology and by Western uh, surveillance methods uh, uh, and systems. Um, do UK citizens feel safer with so many millions of cameras um, I, I think, think that, that they, they feel, feel less safer, safer today, but, but the cameras, cameras are undoubtedly important in bringing perpetrators of crime to justice. justice. So, so they, they do, do fulfill a, a, a certain clear role. role. Um, <coughs> there is a price, there is a trade-off. The, the question, question is, where do we draw the line? Some, Some surveillance is very important and useful. Others would bring us to the brink of abyss. Where, where do we draw the line between digital democracy and digital dictatorship? Well, continuing on the sort of CCTV debate, which I think is an interesting one, and, 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 and uh, illustrates a couple of things. Here, I mean, that was probably set up under the sort of begun under the period of sort of you have a couple of CCTVs, and, and, and then you have an IRA bomber blowing up something in the city of London, and you find the person afterwards. Fine. That was the old analog world. But now we are in the digital world. You, when, when you take, take analog, analog data, data into the digital world, world you, you can, can do a lot of things with it. And you can store them, and you have algorithms and signal processing. So, so we're entering completely unknown territory on what can happen with all, all of that data. And add to that the security of that data, who can access it and who can use it. So it raises fundamentally different questions from the ones that were there when the system was set up. The same with, with this metadata meta discussion that we had in Europe, Europe which makes me somewhat nervous. nervous. Because, because go back to metadata in the beginning, beginning. well, it, it was the billing information of the telecom companies, more or less. Now, now you can, can find a lot of things by metadata, data. And, and, and then the big data acknowledges of that. So, so it might have started with something, with new technologies, it becomes something different and changes the parameters of the debate. On security, let's just protecting our secrets. I think, I think two, two lessons. lessons. We, we need, need to do better at defining our secrets. secrets. It, it might be that not that much is or needs to be truly secret in our societies. Mm -hmm. so, so define, define it better and then protect it. Then protect it. I think in certain states, government societies, one has tended to say that virtually everything is secret. That's not good and it's not possible to protect. And final comment on Libya. Uh, and other things. One of the dangers here is in terms of intelligence activities that there's the illusion that you collect a lot of information and you understand everything and policy goes to perfection. Well, if, if, if you assume that NSA is collecting the most information about everything in the world for the sake of the argument, do we see the ultimate wisdom expressed in every aspect of US policy? No, we don't. Yeah, sometimes it's more useful to read a history book than to read all of the intelligence collected by the intelligence agencies. So there's, at the same time as we have this enormous possibility to collect information, 
we don't really have the possibility to sometimes understand what we collect. And sometimes we need to have somewhat of a distance to this as well when it comes to the policy makers. Excellent wisdom from the panel. Thank you very much. My, my closing comment, I really have a comment from CERN who said he did these vulnerability assessments in, in the cybersecurity field, but it's called the Red Team. One of my favorite quotes, I recently did a cyber conflict history book, and my favorite quote said, few if any security controls can stop a dedicated Red Team, some, from someone like him in Breaking In. That quote was from 1979. So over 35 years, the bad guys have had the advantage. So to close this...